It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Valentina DeSanto from Stockholm University. So Valentina got her bachelor in natural science from University of Ferenc in Italy. Then she got her master in biology from University of West Florida and a PhD in biology also uh, from Boston University. And after that, she joined George, Lod George Lauder's lab in uh, Harvard as a postdoc research fellow. And since 2019, uh, she joined Stockholm University as an assistant professor. So she's interested in uh, comparative psychology, biomechanics, fish locomotion, and a lot of interesting topics. And she won a lot of awards. And I just give several examples. So here, uh, she got Women Leaders Award. She made a difference in European Women's Management Development Interaction Network in 2018. And she won Director's Outstanding Teaching Award in the Marine Program in 2014. And today, she will give a talk titled Climate Change and Locomotion, Insights into Energetics and Biomechanics of Fishes. So now we are uh, very, very happy that you, uh, you can give a talk here and we are now looking very much for your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, let me share my screen. Right, thank you for inviting me. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about some of the work I've been doing on um, biomechanics and physiology of fishes and particular the work I've been doing with skates, which, is, which are uh, weird fishes, but also uh, really cool. <laughs> so hopefully you'll enjoy uh, looking at them too. So um, fishes, just like any other organism, they need to, um, oops, okay. They need to acquire energy and divide the energy they acquire from the environment across different physiological processes. Now, this seems as a pretty straightforward task. However, for uh, aquatic organisms like fishes, this is extremely complicated by the fact that their physiology is affected by environmental factors. And some of these factors are changing with anthropogenic activity. And so we can see, for example, there is an increase in temperature in the environment. The ocean are becoming acidified. Uh, there is less oxygen with also because of temperature increase. Salinity and flow and sedimentation are changing, for example, on the reefs. All these factors, of course, are affecting the physiology of individual fishes. Um, for example, here we're thinking about uh, locomotor performance growth, uh, digestion efficiency or rates, the immune defense, IU os osmo regulation and reproduction. All the changes at the individual level will of course have an effect on the ecology, not only the population of the species, but also the whole ecosystem. So it's important for physiologists to figure out what's happening at the individual level so that ecologists can actually um, understand the mechanisms behind those large scale shift in population growth or behavior, timing of events, uh, morphology, and ultimately survival of not only species, but also uh, communities. Um, so if, if fishes or other organisms are affected by the environment, a change in environment, there are, they can either move, you know, if they're uh, mobile, or they can adjust to the environment. And there are two major ways organisms can actually adjust to the environment change. One is adaptation. In this case, let's say we have some uh, phenotypes present in the population. And there are some, for example, in this case for temperature, they're already warm adapted. So uh, in this case, uh, this, uh, these organisms will increase in number, in these individuals will increase in number in the population as temperature increases. So there is a shift in the phenotype frequency in this population. Um, but this requires, of course, that these, these organisms, these individuals are already there present. The other one is acclimatization or acclimation. In this case, we see a physiological, behavior, or morphological adjustment uh, that broadens a, a certain performance, let's say locomotor performance, but there is no genetic selection. So for example, uh, an organism can perform better at a given temperature after acclimation, uh, but the, 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 the genetic uh, makeup doesn't change, of course. Um, and 
typically I would say most ecology and physiologists will assume that organisms that live in temperate conditions and environment, they are better able to broaden this performance curve. So I keep maintaining performance across different conditions. In this case, I was showing temperature. However, I argue that, let's say that we have a, a species that we can find in two locations, and these two locations have different temperatures. If there is full flow or free flow of individuals from both locations, then I will agree that we're gonna see a one um, performance curve that represents all the indivi most individuals of the species. However, in most cases, what you see is that there is some sort of a barrier to performance. And this barrier could be you know, a physical performance, uh, sorry, a physical barrier, or um, a barrier given by the fact that this species is not able to disperse as far. And so this low dispersal will produce low polymorphism within each locality. So the individuals are similar at these localities, but variation across them. So there is local adaptation and variation across locations. In this case, then you will see uh, the evolution of either counter gradient variation, where two populations of the same species have the same, let's say, thermal optimal right here, the peak, but the colder population is outperforming the, more, the warmer population because they're sitting at their preferred temperature for a shorter window of time. So they need to outperform. So for example, they need to grow faster. And so we see this in, in fishes a lot. Or there is thermal adaptation, where the thermal optimal actually shifts to match um, the local conditions in their environment. Um, so basically, if we see a species that has low dispersal, for either locomotor capacity or there's some barrier, then we expect to see low acclimation capacity. Also low variation within each locality. So you can see local adaptation and high variation between localities. And the opposite is if we, we find the species with high dispersal. So dispersal to me, when I was thinking about the problem of climate change effect on, on individuals and species became like a very important uh, factor to keep in, in consideration when trying to uh, predict how a species will respond to changes in the environment. Um, and so the question was really, there is a role of local adaptation and dispersal capacity on responses of these fishes uh, to climate change stressors, in particular ocean acidification and warming. So I used a little skate to do this experiment. It's different than most studies you will see uh, on the, uh, bony fishes, for example. But the little skate was very interesting for me uh, because first of all, it was a local species. So I could get all year round, which was very important when I was a PhD student. But also this little skate in the Northwestern Atlantic showed two different major body size. So here you see the Gulf of Maine and the George's Bank. Uh, these are uh, Boston is right here. So you see here that these two skates are just about 150 kilometers apart, but the Gulf of Maine skates, even though they're the same species with the genetics, they are much, much larger than the George's Bank skates. And you also see that the Gulf of Maine skates are living in waters that are slightly colder the George's Bank skates are sitting in a little bit a slightly warmer te temperature um, waters, and also there is a lot of upwelling in this area. Uh, they also show strong philopatry. So the females seem to go back to the place where they hatch to actually lay eggs. And as you can see from these videos, the embryos are very large and active. So we can observe movement of the embryos inside the egg case without any uh, microscope or it's very, well, it's relatively easy actually to measure metabolic rates in embryos. Embryos can be about five grams, so are really large compared to bony fishes. Um, but I want to know, first of all, before doing the genetics that I actually did later, why was, were these two population potentially showing different body size? Was it because maybe the George's bank skates were smaller because they were stressed? And so there was just one big population and didn't really matter. There was not genetic difference. Or it was because there is some sort of counter gradient variation where the 
Gulf of Maine population needs to grow faster just because they're in colder water, they can experience their preferred temperature for a shorter period of time. And will this performance then between population be different uh, when, um, when we put them in different uh, conditions like of CO2 and temperature? So what I did for my PhD, I took embryos from different mothers coming from these two different locations and I placed them in what we call a common gutter condition uh, experiment in a fully cross experimental design when we, when I um, basically use current and future condition of temperature, levels of temperature and CO2. And I wanted to also tease apart the effect of temperature and CO2 together or separate. So that's why I did a full cross experimental design. And I started measuring uh, different parameters, development, uh, size, uh, etching, survival. But I'm going to just show you a few um, of those uh, measurements I took, otherwise it will be too long. So the first one I show you is the active metabolic rate of embryos inside the egg case. So you, see, you can see that the embryos are building their tail constantly. And they did need to do this, otherwise they will die because the water inside the egg case gets uh, full of um, metabolites very quickly. And so they need to steer clean water inside the case. And this movement actually increases metabolic rate by 80%. So it's a very important and high, energetically high, uh, costly uh, action. So we, by putting these skates in a respirometer, we can measure the metabolic rate. And so what, I, what you can see here, there are the two populations the Georges Bank and the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf of Maine are the larger ones. The three temperature I used, um, the 15, 18, and 20. And then the two pH condition, which simulate ocean acidification, the control, and the low pH, which are high CO2. So what you can see here is that the Gulf of Maine skates have a higher metabolic rates while they're active. They, the ocean acidification exacerbates the effect of warming on metabolic rates, which means that they increase the cost of uh, being active um, when you combine them with, with, ocean, sorry, with the ocean, ocean warming. And the embryo's performance curve actually suggests counter gradient variation. You can see here at the peak performance or peak activity that the Gulf of Maine have a higher metabolic rate than the, than the Georges Bank. Uh, skates. So we can see an effect here. This was not on, the only effect I saw in the skates. The, the Gulf of Maine skates will also uh, develop faster, even a month uh, faster. So out of six months, maybe the Gulf of Maine skates will etch within five months. So it's a significantly a shorter period of time. Also, uh, the Gulf of Maine skates were much larger. So these two particular individuals are interesting because they etch on the same day. Um, they were maintained in the same conditions throughout development from day one. And you can still see a huge difference in body size. What I also found was that temperature increases body size of individuals. Of course, they had uh, plenty of, of food. Uh, it was not uh, in control for food. But even at etching, the, the skates were much larger at high temperature. The only thing though was that these kids were much larger, but the body condition was much lower. So basically per uh, surface area, uh, they had less body mass. So I wanted to also figure out if temperature and CO2 had an effect on the internal morphology of skates. And we know, for example, from a lot of studies on ocean acidification, marine invertebrates, they are, they are calcium carbonate systems, they're basically acidification deep in general decreases mineralization. And in this very famous study on pteropods, you've probably seen it before, just the 45 days exposure to high CO2 conditions caused this pteropod shell to dissolve. So vertebrates have a calcium phosphate system and skates are a little bit, I have to admit, a little bit weird uh, compared to most vertebrates because their skeleton is made of cartilage. So it's the same stuff as our nose and ears. However, in the lanzobranchs, which includes skates, the skeleton of these animals is covered uh, by a layer of tiles. These are called tesserae. These are highly 
highly mineralized tiles, which allows the skate and the other lancer branks like sharks to a very light skeleton, but very stiff. So you can see here, there is the unmineralized core, which under X-ray, it appears transparent. And then there is this tile mineralization, basically, uh, that maintains this, this skeleton really uh, stiff. So uh, by just looking at CT scan of the skeleton of this fish, it's possible to pick just the mineralized portion of the skeleton and then quantify the amount of minerals or density of the skeleton. So that's what I did. Here you can see a CT scan or just the alpha of the skate. What I want to show you here is that the skeleton really looks like it's made of hollow um, structures, but really what you see here is the unmineralized portion, uh, the vertebra, right here, you don't see it right here, the denticles, the denticles are basically scales of skates, and the skates don't have their body completely covered in scales, but uh, they have sparse scales right here, and the wing, which are the pectoral fins that are important for uh, swimming, and the crura, which are this structure, um, people call them also the feet of skates, although they're not feet, of course. Um, but they're basically modified pelvic fin that the skates use to walk on the substratum. So they're also very important for locomotion. And I scanned each sample with an hydroxy apatite standard, which is basically calcium phosphate. And I could quantify um, the amount of uh, hydroxy apatite in their skeleton. So what I show you are two temperature and two CO2 conditions. So here are 15 degrees. You see hydroxy apatite right here and the different parts. And you see that at high acidification, so at a CO2 of 1100, which we expect by year 2100, we see that the crura and the jaws are increasing in mineralization with ocean acidification. And there is no effect on the denticle or the vertebra or the wing of the skate. So when, when we look at 20 degrees, we see the same effect on the crude. So regardless of temperature, CO2 is increasing mineralization in, in the crude, which are important for walking. Here, what we see is really interesting, actually. Regardless of CO2 conditions, temperature increase decreases the amount of mineralization in the pectoral fins of the skate. And these are, will have consequences for, for swimming uh, locomotion. So this was, I didn't expect this as a result at all, actually. I thought that, you know, this is my skates, it either, nothing will happen to them or maybe a decrease in mineralization. But what we see here, if this is true also for other fish, is that in calcium phosphate system, mineralization increases with acidification which is the opposite of what happens to inver marine invertebrates where mineralization generally decreases with acidification. Uh, the real reason, or the reasons yet, we need to test some hypothesis, but I give yeah, I had for this results. So the first one is that warming possibly decreases mineralization because there is a mismatch between growth and mineral deposition. So it's possible that because the skates are growing in width, so the wings are growing really fast, the first weeks of, of you know, uh, up post etching, that maybe, maybe uh, that's why only in the wing you see that this warming is affecting their mineralization. It's also possible that skates increase phosphate to counteract acidity and we see this in, uh, in, in fluids and blood of skates as you increase CO2 in the water they will increase phosphate and it's possible that they dump basically this extra uh, phosphate in tissues and skeleton. Still some parts will be more mineralized than others around some experiments and test this. But regardless of the causes, there are some consequences of changing the mineralization of the skeleton. And the first one is that stiffness and strength correlate with mineralization. So if some parts are becoming more mineralized, that also means they become stiff, stiffer and stronger. So perhaps there is an even advantage for feeding or uh, for walking the substratum if the skates are increasing mineralization. Um, but of course, there is also this advantage of having less stiff wings uh, because these skates need to use their pectoral fins, of course, to, to swim. 
if the body is becoming more mineralized because of ocean acidification, there is a change in buoyancy. So skates might become heavier, just like other fishes, if we can find the same in other fishes, of course. And if we look in nature, the batoids with the highest mineral content are already the ones that are the most sedentary. So we might have already a clue that if the skates are becoming heavier, uh, then they will swim less. Also, these fishes have no swim bladder, so they need to, to swim to lift off the ocean, in the bottom of the ocean. And of course, if it's more expensive to, to lift up, the metabolic rates are gonna go up. Um, so there is an increased cost of locomotion right there. So when I start looking at this data, immediately my, my, my question was, what happened to these fishes when they need to escape? So what, the skates are really small for a very long time. And they're basically the size of an Oreo, just um, to give you an idea. So basically any fish, <laughs> almost any fish in the ocean could eat them. So, um, they need to be able to escape. And they, they obviously can hide, and you can see a video of a stingray hiding in the substratum, or they even leap out of the water. But if they want to avoid to be eaten, they need to be able to burst, uh, escape uh, from the predator and swim really fast. So in the lab, we can test the burst, the escape response of skates and how much it costs by uh, doing what we call a chase experiment. Uh, during the chase experiment, we expect the fish to be, to, to be able to, to swim away from us just by lightly touching them. But skates, as you can see, that was on the right, on the left, sorry, was a stingray. On the right here, you see a skate. And skates are very docile, and they get used to be handled very quickly, and they don't mind to be held at all. So it's very hard, actually, to chase them because they don't mind to be touched. And so what I had to do, I had to come up with a new um, methods in a way and flip them on the, on the back like little pancakes. And they don't, they hate that basically. They really don't like it. And so they will ride themselves all the time and burst and run away from me, <laughs> swim away from me. Uh, until they fatigue, which usually takes about five minutes maximum. And then these skates were placed in the respirometer after the exercise, and the metabolic rate during recovery was measured for up to an hour, which was enough to, to see a restoration of metabolic rates to a resting state. We were able, I was able to put them in a respirometer after the exercise because escape response is mostly fueled by anaerobic metabolism, so that creates an oxygen adapt. And the oxygen depth is a good proxy for the metabolic rate, and well, the, the energy that this fish needed during the exercise. So here I'll show you uh, a lot of data, but I'm gonna go through it with you. So this is the recovery metabolic rate over time. Time zero is the time of fatigue, and then you can see at five minutes intervals I measured the metabolic rate. So that these are the two population. The George's Bank, I just wanted to remind you that the smaller skates and the Gulf of Maine, the larger ones. The three temperature I used here, 18, 15, 18, and 20. And the two control and low pH conditions. Um, so what you see here is that the George's Bank, so the smaller skates, have more energy to uh, exercise to exhaustion. Now, I should say, in case you're not familiar with um, recovery metabolic rates, physiologists, most physiology believe at least, uh, that for most species of fish, the, the recovery metabolic rate is a good, pro from an exhaustive exercise, is a good proxy for the maximum amount of energy this fish will have to be active. So if that's correct, uh, you know, I never know, uh, we need to test a lot of fish, but um, if this is correct, then you can see that the George's Bank skate have more energy than the Gulf of Maine skate to exercise. Not only that, I don't show you that those data, but the George's Bank skate could exercise more intensively and also for a longer period of time when you compare to the Gulf of Maine skates. Also, that they, they perform best at 18 degrees, while the Gulf of Maine skates did better at 15 degrees, and for both populations and any 
uh, pH condition, uh, sorry, the temperature condition, the pH, the low pH actually redu uh, reduces um, the capacity to return to resting state quickly. So it prolonged the time it took for the skates to recover from exercise. So what I showed you here was that the even neighboring population can respond differently to ocean acidification and warming, which is incredible. That we know we assume that a species will respond to mental stressors. And then warming acidification can prolong the time to recover from exhausting exercise. And the northern population, so the largest skates, have a reduced aerobic scope, which means they have a less amount of energy to exercise exhaustively. And the juvenile skate, in a way, they show us um, some version of a thermal variation in active metabolic rates, where you see that the peak of their performance changes. I want to remind you that when they were uh, embryos, they had the same thermal optimum, let's say. Now, I should say here, I didn't put any temperature, because I'm assuming that this is how the, this skate uh, performs might look like, uh, but 15 was 12 performance often. So I just want to show that here they might, the, the performance curves might look something like that. So they're shifting in optimum, uh, thermal optimum, but also that the smaller skates are outperforming uh, the larger skates. So we know that these skates are affected by ocean acidification and warming. So I guess the question is, can they migrate? Can they find a thermal refugia or different places where, where they can thrive? And here they have two obvious, obvious options, to go north or to go to deeper water. In either case, they need to migrate. So if you're familiar with some of those beautiful Kaunos race migration that you see on the internet a lot, you might think that batoids are actually really good swimmers. However, most species are not pelagic and they walk using the crura. You can see this video here on the substrate. And just once in a while, they pick up and they start swimming. And they are pretty bad swimmers. I discovered that very quickly. When I looked into the literature, I was trying to figure out any study on swimming energetics of any batoid, and there were zero. Most studies were done on trout, and trout are the model organisms for swimming energetics. And what you see in all these studies is that metabolic rates pretty much increase with speed, uh, linearly. And I also noticed that Virtually every single species that has been tested so far show the same pattern. So metabolic rates increase with speed. Um, so when I saw this, I got immediately suspicious <laughs> um, because actually what you expect to find by in theory, in theory is that there are supposed to be high posterior, posterior costs at low speed. And this is given by uh, the fact that fish are not really stable at low speeds. And this cost might be really high if you need to hover, at, to, because if uh, you don't have any swim bladder, and to hover, you need to also move your fins, so you have to swim. But even if you have a swim bladder, you might need to have some posterior adjustment. And here you can see a bluegill, which is a really good swimmer, at zero, speed equals zero, is still moving their pectoral fins. If you have any fish in a tank, uh, if, even if they're not moving uh, around, if they're old in position, um, they're mostly, most likely to be uh, flapping their pectoral fins. The reason is they're avoiding rolling. Um, and so there are postural costs that we, we need to keep in consideration. So it's almost impossible that the low, at the low speeds, this metabolic rate will be close to resting metabolic rate. And then of course, at high speed, it's very difficult to, to swim. So uh, they will increase metabolic cost a lot. And then we should find an intermediate minimum where swimming is pretty uh, economical. And we see this in most flying animals. So we should see this in fish too. And actually, 
if you think about when you go on a bike and you're uh, mm, approaching speed equals zero, so you're almost stopping, you cannot keep your feet up. You need to put your feet down because you have a lot of trouble uh, maintaining equilibrium. As you start cruising, then it becomes much easier. You can go for a long period of time, backing around. But if you go really, really fast, then it's becoming really metabolically costly. And then at one point you need to stop. So I expect fish to behave just like us on a bike. And I think one of the reasons why we don't see this in the literature is that most people will use the critical swimming protocol, um, which is the standard that has been uh, basically uh, used for salmonids and for any other species of fish. So basically here, if you're not familiar with this protocol, um, the researcher increases the uh, speed and then uh, certain intervals, let's say for 10 minutes, they measure the metabolic rate and then increase speed again and then measure the metabolic rate increase until you get to a critical swimming speed where they assume then that the fish starts using white muscle and anaerobic metabolism. And then that's why they measure the recovery metabolic rate at the end. So this protocol assumes that there is no anaerobic metabolism or carryover effect at any of these speeds. So they assume actually that the fish can swim indefinitely at these speeds. So now you understand why I was a little bit skeptical about this uh, protocol and these results. So there is another protocol, which I prefer. It takes a much longer time to, to run these experiments, but I think it might be a little bit more safe, uh, which is to measure one speed at a time. So you measure, let's say, for 10 minutes, a swimming uh, metabolic rates at one speed, and then you stop the flow and you measure recovery rates. Then you can figure out if there is any anaerobic component in that 10 minutes, in those 10 minutes uh, swimming. So that's what I did. Um, and Basically, uh, my idea was that in, in, um, in, this in, the, in these papers, maybe, what they measure was the first metabolic rate at the first speed, and then by measuring continuously high and higher speeds, maybe they, have, they were measuring the metabolic rate to the next speed, plus the anaerobic component, the oxygen that they were accumulating from the previous speeds. And that's why you, you saw maybe this uh, exponential curve instead of a more of a J or U shaped curve. So my question was then, not only what was the swimming capacity of skates, which was my original question, can they migrate? But also more, more fundamental questions about the relationship between metabolic rates and swimming speed in general in fishes. Of course, I still use my skates uh, for this experiment. I use the two protocols. I want to, point to compare uh, the results of these two protocols. And here you can see a skate swimming in a flow tank. You have to be a little creative. The skates don't like to swim. Um, so I had to create this 45 degree ramp. So the skate will have to basically was forced to swim up uh, from the bottom of the, of the tank. And this uh, honeycomb will not dis distort too much uh, the flow. So the flow was con still considered linear, uh, laminar. And then, um, at, of course, they were in the swimming uh, respirometer, like a, a low ago uh, respirometer right here. So what I did, I measured metabolic rates during swimming and after, after swimming during recovery at each speed and the Eucrit. I measured the all range of speeds that this fish could swim at, which were from 0 0.75 body lengths per second to 2.25 body lengths per second, which is not a huge range to say um, for, for fishes. And then I looked at kinematics, especially posture, because I wanted to see if there was some clue there why they will use it more or less energy at different speeds. And here I'm showing you, again, a lot of data, but I'm gonna go through it with you. So here's the recovery rate. Um, over time, so at uh, five minutes intervals. Right here, I place the metabolic rate during swimming as a reference. Here is the recovery metabolic rate compared to the resting metabolic rate. So we see here at any speed tested, this fish was showing a significant increase in metabolic rates during uh, recovery, which was a clue that they were using 
basically, anaerobic metabolism during those 10 minutes swimming uh, exercise. So that was uh, extremely exciting. Uh, sometimes the anaerobic component is even higher than the aerobic component. Um, so that was very exciting. And so when, it, when we constructed this relationship between speed and metabolic rates during swimming, uh, with the 10 minutes protocol, you see a very nice U-shaped curve with a minimum around 1.25 to 1.5 body lengths per second. When we added the cost of recovery, which is the true cost of locomotion at those speeds, then you can see that metabolic rates increase significantly at any speed tested. And then we use the Euclid protocol. And this is, was really the ha -ha moment. I knew I was, I got also lucky that I was right this time, I think. Um, but basically what you see is that most fish stop swimming at 1.5 body lengths per second, which shows that the Euclid protocol, which is the standard for fish swimming um, energetics, has the potential to grossly underestimate the maximum amount of speed, speeds or the maximum speed that this, any fish can swim at. Only one fish, one champion, swam beyond 1.5 body lengths per second to 1.75 body lengths per second. This is what happened. That the metabolic rate for that fish was similar to uh, the, the measurement taken at 10 minutes with recovery, so the true cost of locomotion. So here I think there are two scenarios I see. One, that fish might get tired with the, the Euclid protocol because there is a carryover effect of swimming all the speeds and they might stop when they feel like uh, stopping and start starting to recover from that exercise or they might push beyond that point. But if they do so, they're gonna start to pay off the oxygen debt they've been accumulating plus they need to use a lot more energy to swim uh, faster. Um, so I wanted to see if there was any of this, um, these patterns in also the kinematics of fish. So here you see a skate swimming, the flow tank. And when we look at body angle, actually, we see a sort of a similar uh, U-shape curve between speed and body angle. Um, Especially here at low speeds, it's difficult for the skate to create a lift. So they're like an airplane. They're trying to uh, pitch their body to, to create a lift. Then at intermediate to high speed, they are pretty horizontal. But then at this high speed, they don't really need to, again, um, increase their body angle. But if you see them swimming at very high speed, they're struggling a lot. So it's a very, max, you know, the, the maximum speed they can swim at. So I think maybe there are some uh, postural, more postural problems there, and that's why they are increasing their body angle. So here another thing, when we look at the margin, uh, the pectoral fin, what you see is that there is a different curvature, um, 3D curvature when we compare one body length per second versus two body lengths per second. So here is the profile of the skate wing and here is the profile over time as the fin is pushed down into the flow. So the fish needs to push down the fin to the flow to create thrust. So here the fin margin in green here you can see that actually the flow is pushing up the margin a little bit so there is a low resistance from the skate wing to go up a little. By two body lengths per second, the skate is actually cupping their fin into the flow and also creating this V, this notch. This notch is very important because it reminds us of the arch that we have in our feet that allows basically to sustain our body weight. And skates might do something similar. Their, their fin are really thin. And so to different their, their wing, they might create this notch, which is um, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, if you try to push down the piece of paper, you will see that there is a lot of resistance. But then if you fold that paper in a V and then you try to push it down, then you won't have so much trouble. So they're trying to increase stiffness without adding any mass uh, to their fans. So if you remember uh, my, my study on the morphology, the mineralization of wing skates, uh, sorry, skate, skate wings with temperature. You remember that 
uh, mineralization is going down with temperature. So we might see that these skates um, might need even more energy to swim faster in warming oceans. And I know what you're thinking, that was a very weird fish. So what happens with a rainbow trout? So what I did, I just did the same experiment with rainbow trout, and here I'll just show you uh, the, the data from uh, this one fish. Um, but basically, what you see is that the swim metabolic rate and speed also show a J, in this case, a J-shaped curve. So if this, this fish actually only swam up to two body lines per second, like skates, it would be more of, of a U-shaped curve. So I guess the J and U-shaped curve really are uh, a factor on many speeds beyond the intermediate minimum they can swim at, so they will look more like a J. But what I want you to, sh to see really is that at 0 0.5 body lengths per second, this trout, which is the model organism for, for swimming, is a champion of swimming, is having a lot of trouble. It's assuming a positive body angle into the flow and the dorsal fin here and the pelvic fin are spread out and they're flapping constantly. By 1.25 body lengths per second, this trout is swimming really straight the dorsal fin and the pelvic fin are folded in and it's just cruising. And it can go at this speed for a very long time. So even for this model organism, people study them, for, I don't know for how many, many decades, basically we see the same, um, the same effect that we see in, in the little skate. So hopefully I convinced you that fishes use a combination of aerobic and anaerobic metabolism and any speed. Fishes are made mostly of white muscle. Even uh, tuna, which are, you know, they have a lot of uh, red muscle. They only have maybe around 11 to 14% red muscle in their body. And we really need to consider kinematics when testing energetics of swimming. And even the fin margin can tell you a lot about how much energy a fish needs to, to a swim. And we really should expect fishes to exhibit a U or J shaped metabolic speed curve. And again, this, the shape might depend a little bit on the amount of speeds uh, this fish can swim below or beyond uh, the minimum. And really to answer the original question, yes, skates are best swimmers. Um, Benti batoids have limited dispersal capacity. And this I, my, my hypothesis is that this is the reason why we see um, these differences between this very close population of skates, only 150 kilometers apart. We see low acclimatization capacity, even after developmental acclimation, they don't really shift uh, the performance. There is low variation within location, but high variation between locations, the two populations. So, uh, this is what I like to do. I like to integrate climate science, uh, physiology, and biomechanics, um, because this really allows me to understand the mechani mechanism, uh, the responses of my fishes to change the environment. And I believe that if we combine physiology and biomechanics, we can really uh, work with ecologists to understand major changes in distribution, timing of events, or even biomass in, in nature. Now, I have to say in the last few slides, I want to talk a little bit about how I even integrate physiology and biomechanics further by working with um, engineers to modify the behavior and the morphology of fishes that we cannot do with real fish. So the first one I want to show you is um, some simulation I, I've been doing with Professor Hai Bo Dong in University of Virginia. This one with our little trout. So we basically fit a mesh on the trout and we create a 3D model. And here you can see the 3D model of the trout swimming next to the real trout and it matches the movement of the trout really well. Once we achieve this, we can change the movement of the, of the model trout however we want and we can change the morphology to see our performance changes. So here I just show you um, a small part of the project where we compare the, the thrust, so the performance of this trout with or without 
dorsal and anal fin in this case. So the, sh the flow shed by, the vortex is shed by the, uh, the dorsal and the anal fin that are actually interacting with the body and with the, the caudal fin of this fish. And that interaction increases thrust. So if we remove actually those fins, you see that uh, thrust decreases by about 2.5% or in the trunk and 18% of the caudal fin. So here's a way when we can you know, literally cut off fins and see what happens to this fish without actually harming a real fish. We can also create robotic units and these are a lot of fun. Um, so the first one on the top here, you see an, an hybrid uh, skate. So this hybrid is um, out of a Frankenstein movie. It's made of um, transgenic um, our earth, our cells uh, from a mouse, and they are basically modified to um, contract with um, light stimuli. And then there is the skeleton of gold, which is a good, uh, um, is very uh, good co conducing uh, energy. And basically, this this skate was the cyber skate was modeled to match as close as possible the movement of a real skate, and they did a pretty good job, to be honest. The second one is a tuna bot. So this fish is crazy. This tuna bot is crazy. It's been uh, tethered. The only reason why it has, has all this scale was because it's so fast that we were scared that it would break uh, the flow tank. But this fish, this <laughs> fake fish, this robotic fish, is so is really fast, but also really really efficient. So it was a nice way to create an underwater uh, robotic unit that mimics a real tuna in efficiency and uh, efficiency also. And the last one is one of my favorite is a bass bot, of course, based on a bass. And in this case we can modulate the movement of dorsal fins, anal and pelvic fin, anything we want to put on this robotic fish and see how performance changes by modulating those, those fins uh, during acceleration, steady swimming, maneuvering, anything we can think of. So these are not just fun, dumb um, robotic units, but they're also really important to understand performance of fish, what we cannot do on a real fish. We cannot tell a fish to do a certain movement all the time. And definitely we don't want to change by cutting the fins and stuff of fish. Um, the last couple of slides, I want to show you just some preliminary work I've been doing on schooling behavior. Schooling behavior is one of those cool phenomena in nature because allows uh, fishes to be protected Protected by a certain extent to, from predators, but also to find food and mates pretty easily. But for me, it's interesting because, in theory, um, if the fish put themselves in, in a certain configuration, they can save energy. So for me, uh, it's important to understand how fishes exploit the vortices inside the school to save energy during locomotion. So what we're trying to do is to have, uh, to reconstruct their movement of the school in 3D. We have uh, three cameras, three SP cameras, to show you the dorsal view, an angle view, so you can see individual fishes, and the lateral view. The lateral view is a little tricky because uh, there is a lot of occlusion, but by using also the, the angle view, the 45 degrees angle view, we can see uh, all the fishes. And then we are trying to use the club cut to automatically get, get this data from, <laughs> extract data um, coordinates from these fishes, which is very challenging in 3D especially. So here are some preliminary uh, videos. This is just showing you the dorsal view. Here I'm disrupting the school by introducing food and you can see that the club cut is doing a very good job tracking different parts that I sign uh, on this fish. And um, yeah, uh, we are trying to <laughs> extract now 3D kinematics on these videos, uh, which are very long because you know we need to allow 
um, movement of fish around. I mean, very long, I'm talking about eight seconds maximum, which are about 8,000 frames. So that's a lot, a lot of videos, uh, a lot of frames to, to analyze. But I want to show you some related study on um, schooling, where I found that, that there is also a J-shaped energetic speed, school, uh, speed uh, school, um, curve during schooling, uh, which is interesting. So in this case, we are looking at tilt B frequency, which is a good proxy for energetic cost um, uh, for, for locomotion. We see here is that low speed, the fish is using more energy, the beating their tail more frequently than at a minimum of two to three body lengths per second. I wanted to know though if the position within the school will affect this curve. So what happens when you're a fish and you have another fish swimming in front of you versus you have no fish swimming in front of you. So in this case, I don't care if this fish is in the back and can see other fishes. I just care that it doesn't have any fish right in front of them. And so when we divide the data based on the position, yes, we see a difference. Um, there, is, there is a difference in the cost of, of swimming for fishes that are in, beyond another fish. So they cost less, actually less energy to swim beyond another fish. So maybe these fishes are using, exploiting the vortices shed by fishes in front to swim more efficiently. Here you don't see any difference. And actually, if you look at the videos of fish swimming really slow, you can see that the school breaks down a little bit and becomes more like a shoal. Um, they're not really structured and uh, fish are not swimming um, in any sort of confirmation, really. So I'm gonna leave this to that <laughs> because we still have to analyze a lot of this data. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators in the studies I've shown here, which are mostly uh, from Boston University and, and Harvard, and my latest studies, of course, at Stockholm University. I'd like to, to say before I stop my talk and take any questions that I'm, I have an open position for a postdoc. So if you know anybody or you want to, or you are someone who is looking for a postdoc, uh, drop me an email. Thank you. Thanks, Valentino. It's very fantastic talk. So, uh, any questions? So, uh, when you uh, compare or compare the body size of the George Blank and the Gulf Marine, um, you explore some uh, uh, factors. For example, the temperature and also uh, some migration behavior. Um, did you consider the flow direction? Because you know, when the animals live in the front of the flow, it may get food, uh, get more food with higher probability. So the, the food may go with the flow, right? If you live in the front of the flow, then you can get more food. Then maybe you can get more, you know, energy and get more, bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So actually, the, um, the George's Bank is a place of upwelling. So there's, there's many more nutrients uh, in the George's Bank. But in this case, yeah, you're right. We never know in nature, right? If the diet is slightly different or they can get more food. Um, and that might be a case. But in this case, um, the states were etched in the lab. So they were, they were not... Um, they didn't have any difference in food type. And when they're etching, they're still not eating. So everything has to do with maybe maternal fat, although I use different mothers, a lot of different mothers. So each skate embryos were from a different mother. Um, but also uh, I looked at uh, the yolk size uh, of the embryos and they were, not significant. they were not significantly, they were not significantly yeah. different. So they were the same, yeah. Cool. But yeah, it's, it's a good question. You never know in nature if they're eating more food, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question related to your um, the U shape or J shape uh, energy yeah. cost versus swing speed. Um, so you reported the uh, uh, oxygen consumption and as a uh, index for the energy cost. 
did you measure the frequency amplitude as um, yeah. indexed for the, and also another interesting question, because um, um, I read several papers, like fish, if fish swim very close to the bottom, yeah. then it will take advantage of the flow, which is reflected from the bottom, yeah. which might help the fish save energy. So I want to, uh, I want, I'm wondering when the flow is very slow, why the fish didn't like just very close to the bottom and then just take a rest there and the fish should have uh, like swim in the middle. Yeah, because I basically force them not to do that. So if you go okay. very slow, the scapey will not swim. They will just sit on the bottom, maybe walk. Yes, okay. Uh, so by creating a ramp, uh, there was oh, I see. see. The skate could not go. Down. If they went went down, they would just be pushed back on the floor, so they would not be able to sit down. And that oh. was to force them to to swim a little slow, to see if there was that shape. Because otherwise, yeah, they will not swim unless they were maybe at one point twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Them. That's what I want. <laughs> yeah. But but if you have a slope, then how the lander flow can generate for the. Because it was a honeycomb. The honeycomb is also, um, yeah. Like, okay. So it was a honeycomb. It was cut 45 degrees, but the honeycomb was still straight. So there was, uh, the flow was not disrupted. But how about the flow below the honeycomb? I mean, if you have honeycomb this way and then you have this. Uh, no, it was this just was a, across the whole, it was across the whole flow tank. Okay. So it was not affecting, it was always lam laminar everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Um, and for the group level energy cost, uh, um, you measure how many fish there? Was that? So uh, you energy, energy cost versus the group level, like you yeah. have, um, you also find there's a J shape. Yeah. Um, for those, uh, how many fish there and why? 14, you 14, 14 fish oh. and five schools. That's a lot. So that's. Uh, and you find that the formation is not always like you need to stay together? No. So at low okay. speed, it gets a little loosened. I would call it a show instead of a school. Although, you know, it's semantics, but. So there's not a, a lot of structure at low speed. So it could be because of that. It could be because at low speed, fish use more energy to swim. Yeah. Could be, yeah. So Thanks. Both, both reasons.